chapter 5, verses 22 to 33. I don't have a fancy title. Uh, It's just Wives and Husbands. And so, again, that's Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 to 33. If you have found your places, uh, please stand out of reverence for God's word. And please give God your careful attention to uh, the reading of his word, starting with verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh." This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. This is the word of God. You may be seated. Let's once again bow our heads and ask God to give us uh, help, understanding, and illumination into his word. Father, we do thank you that you have uh, called us out of darkness and into your light. God, we thank you that you have called us uh, your own. You have called us uh, your adopted sons and daughters. And for some of us, we thank you that uh, you call us to be uh, wives and husbands. Father, as we look into your word and what you say uh, about uh, the calling of wives and husbands, God, we pray that we would not only hear your word clearly, but that we would hear your word with conviction. Uh, Father, we uh, live in a world uh, that oftentimes uh, does not uh, see eye to eye with uh, what you say. And so we pray um, for hearts, God, that would yield uh, to you and uh, your word. Father, we pray that you would help us to not only uh, learn, but we also pray that you would help us to again, be conformed into your image. And so we pray for the preaching and the hearing of your word this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, From a young age, I always dreamed about getting married. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but uh, ever since I was a kid, I think even more than dreaming about dating, I dreamed about getting married. And by the grace of God, uh, he did allow me to marry my wife, uh, Grace, uh, my better half. And uh, I always thought that everyone was just like me. I always thought that everyone wanted to get uh, married just as much as I did. But I've been finding out that uh, there are a growing number of people who actually don't want to get married. Uh, for various reasons, whether it be because of careers or maybe lack of commitment or cohabitation, marriage is actually becoming more difficult to even consider. I think for the first time in our country, unmarried people actually outnumber married people. And we are seeing this shift in Korea as well. According to the Pew Research Center, only 30% of millennials say that having a successful marriage is one of the most important things in life. Uh, Four in ten Americans went even further, saying that marriage was becoming obsolete. 
so this is the biggest social change in the last 60 years. Again, I think technically I'm a millennial. I, I hit the cutoff mark, but I don't think I uh, uh, vibe a lot with them. But uh, because I do think that there is no topic more important or more relevant than the topic of marriage. I think marriage is probably the most important decision that you'll ever make in your entire life. Who you marry and how your marriage does will determine great consequences, not only for your own life, but for society as a whole. Uh, now, I don't want to assume, again, that all of you want to get married or even will get married. But even if you don't get married, even if you don't want to get married for whatever reason, uh, I think you should at the very least know what God says about marriage. Uh, we live in a day and age where the world wants to redefine and redesign what God has already defined and what he has already designed. And I believe that even Satan himself, he's leading the charge in attack against God's definition and design for marriage. We see in the Bible that Satan, he attacked the very first marriage uh, of Adam and Eve. And Satan will continue to attack the even last marriage of Christ and the church. And so as the church, as Christians, we need to question whether we are valuing the world's uh, definition over God's definition. Now, I will also say that at first glance, this passage, it seems very unfavorable and very unfair towards wives. But I hope that throughout this passage, you would actually see that God is actually opposite, being more strict and maybe even more demanding on husbands. And on top of that, I would like all of you to ask this question. Do you believe that God would want to hurt anyone by his design of marriage? Would God want to hurt anyone by his design of marriage? And I hope that you would come to see that however politically incorrect these verses may seem, that God, um, uh, his gift of marriage to us is for our good and ultimately for his glory. So as we go through today's passage, we'll uh, divide it up into two, I guess, broad points. First, what is a wife's calling? And then secondly, what is a husband's calling? So first, what is a wife's calling? We see that uh, in verse 22, it says, a wife's calling is to submit to her husband. Verse 22, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. And verse 24, wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Uh, in 2018, the word submit, I think, probably sounds more like a curse word uh, than the actual S word. Um, the connotation that comes with the word submit uh, is very negative. It sounds very outdated. It sounds very degrading. Uh, but I would like us to be reminded that even Jesus submitted. Jesus submitted to the Father. Jesus, even though he was equal with the Father, he chose to live in submission to the Father. In John chapter 6, verse 38 Jesus says this, he says, I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So you could say that in submission, wives are actually called to imitate Jesus in his submission to the Father. Now another question, uh, who are wives called to submit to? It says that wives are called to submit to their own husbands. So I would like us to understand that verse 22, it does not say this. It does not say, women submit to all men. That's not what it says. This verse is not making a statement about superiority of men over women. This verse is addressing a wife and her one husband. There are even times and places when men, we see, submit to women. Uh, 
Uh, if your woman, if your boss is a woman, then you as a man, you are called to submit to that woman. If you get pulled over by a police officer and she happens to be a woman, as a man, you submit to uh, that woman. Uh, if we were to live in England, uh, there is a queen. Uh, you as a man, you are called to submit to the queen. So, wives and women, this verse is not saying that you need to submit to all men. Uh, and men, this verse is not saying that all women need to submit to you. Some women are called to submit to someone, some men, and some men are called to submit to some women. But in the context of the home, God says that a wife is called to submit to her one husband. God does not call my wife to submit to all men, but God calls my wife to submit to me. Now, I ask another question. Uh, what does submission mean? Again, it has a very negative connotation. So what does submission mean when God calls a wife to submit to her one husband? Submission means willingly supporting the leadership of your husband out of obedience to Christ. That's what submission means. Willingly supporting the leadership of your husband out of obedience to Christ. Submission is not something to be demanded from your husband. Submission is a gift that you deliver to your husband. So submission is not something that your husband takes. Submission is something that you give. As a wife, you are called to help your husband by supporting your husband because why? Your husband is weak. Your, your husband is imperfect. And you are strengthening your husband by supporting your husband in submission. By submitting, you could say that you're helping your husband do what he could not do by himself. When Jesus submitted to the Father, we could say, and I don't know if this sounds heretical, but Jesus helped the Father do what he could not do by himself. Now think about it. Could God have saved sinners without Jesus' submission? Could God have saved sinners without Jesus' submission? I think the answer is no. So submission is not a sign of weakness. Submission is a sign of power that empowers your husband. Also, submission is given not because the husband deserves it, but because Christ deserves it. Sorry. Submission is given not because the husband deserves it, but because Christ deserves it. If we look at verse 22 again, it says, Submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. And then in verse 21, we saw this last week, but it says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So submit to your husbands is not because your husband is worthy, but you are called to submit to your husbands because Jesus is worthy. You're called to submit to your own husbands, not because he is Jesus, but because you revere Jesus. Again, you might say, but that's so unfair. Uh, I can submit to Jesus because he's perfect, but I don't want to submit to my husband because he is imperfect. And it is true, your husband is imperfect. But although your husband will be imperfect, you are called to submit to your husband unless he is sinning against you or he is calling you to sin against God. If your husband tells you to steal, Obviously, you do not submit to what he tells you to do. If your husband abuses you, uh, you do not submit to him. But if he is not sinning against you or telling you to sin, God is saying you are called to support even the imperfect leadership of your husband. Now, asking another question, what does submission not mean? Because again, there are a lot of connotations with the word submission. And here are some things that I would like to clarify about what submission does not mean. First, submission does not mean that a wife is inferior to her husband. 
A wife submitting to her husband does not mean that she is less capable than her husband. She could very well be, quote unquote, superior to her husband. She could be more intelligent than her husband. A wife could very well be physically bigger or even physically stronger than her husband. But that does not mean that she should not submit to her husband. Submission is not about strength or weakness. Submission is not about IQ, it's not about abilities. Again, it is about giving support. God didn't just make androgynous people. He made um, distinct uh, people. And so he made a distinct male and he made a distinct female. They are equal in value and worth, but they are, again, different in calling. A wife and husband are said to be one. They are called to be one flesh, but they are distinct from one another. It's like the Trinity. There is God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. Yet they all have different callings. Even though they are one God, they have different callings. Jesus submits to the Father, but that does not mean that he is inferior to the Father as God in worth, in value, in essence. He has the same attributes as the Father, but again, he had a different calling. The Father was the one who planned, and the Son was the one who did what the Father planned. So a wife submitting to her husband, it is a similar analogy to Jesus submitting to God the Father. There is no difference in their status. There's no difference in their capabilities. There's only a difference in their callings and their commands. Another misconception. Submission does not mean that a wife is a maid to her husband. There are conventional or cultural stereotypes as to what a role, what the role of a wife or husband plays in the home. You may very well have grown up in a home where your mother never worked outside the home, only stayed in the kitchen, only cooked and cleaned and did the laundry. Maybe your father never washed any clothes, never washed any dishes, only sat on the couch to be served. I don't believe that's what a biblical husband looks like. Not because times have changed, but because the Bible says that even Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. If anything, a husband is a servant to his wife, which we will get into later. All that to say, there ought to be mutual service toward one another. If a wife would like to cook and clean and serve her husband in that manner, great. But if a husband would like to serve his wife by cooking or cleaning, that is also great. But all wives are not maids to their husbands. Those servant roles can be discussed and agreed upon and can even change from season to season and from life stage to life stage. And another misconception is that submission does not mean that a wife cannot influence her husband. I believe a wife can influence her husband. A wife is called to be her husband's helper. This doesn't mean that she should always try to manipulate him, but a wife can have good and helpful thoughts and opinions and ideas. She may have even better ideas than her husband. The wife and husband can have discussions, dialogues, I would say even debates. I think Jesus even debated with God the Father in the Garden of Gethsemane. As he was praying before he was going to the cross, he says this in Mark chapter 14, verse 36. He says to the Father, remove this cup from me. Is that not a debate? But how does he conclude? He says, yet not what I will, 
but what you will. So I believe there can be godly debate, but also ultimate submission. A husband and wife should have prayer about important family issues. The wife can even, I believe, change a husband's mind. But in the end, when all is said and done, the husband needs to make the final decision. This doesn't mean that the husband says, hey, do what I say because I'm the man. But the husband takes into consideration all that the wife has communicated. And after he has listened to her and prayed with her, he needs to make the decision. Just, just to give like an example on that, uh, before even coming to Emmanuel Church, uh, there were a, I guess, couple other possibilities of serving at another church. And I presented these options before my wife. And they all had pros and cons. And my wife, she had a very strong conviction to come to Emmanuel. Uh, I didn't know Emmanuel that well. All I knew was that in the 1990s, um, someone was shot in the parking lot. That's pretty much all I knew about Emmanuel. And so I was actually very surprised that uh, my wife strongly wanted to come to Emmanuel. And so I was presenting the, the pros of these other churches. But she, for whatever reason, wanted to come to Emmanuel Church. Now, you know, if, if I was, you know, the bossy man, I could have said, no, woman, you do as I say. You know, we're not going to Emmanuel. We're going here. But obviously, I gave much consideration her thoughts, her feelings. And her thoughts and feelings even began to influence my thoughts and feelings. But at the end of the day, it was me as the husband making that final decision. Again, submission is not this my way or the highway. Submission is giving your support, giving your help. Now moving on to our second uh, main point. What is now a husband's calling? And first we'll see that a husband is called to be the spiritual head of his wife. So look at verse 23, it says, the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. That means that the husband um, is a leader. Now, what exactly is uh, spiritual headship? Again, it does not mean that, husband, you are smarter than your wife. It does not mean that you have a bigger head than your wife. Uh, these are some categories uh, that I think would be helpful for us in terms of understanding what it means to be a spiritual head. First, uh, it means to reject passivity. Okay, As a husband, it means to reject uh, passivity. We actually look at the very first husband, and we see that he was a very bad head because he was very passive. Um, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, when the serpent came to the garden and tempted uh, Eve, Adam's wife, to eat of the forbidden fruit. It says this, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. So Adam, as Eve's husband... Again, he was a bad spiritual head. Why? Because he was passive. He was with her. Now, we don't know if he was with her the whole time or even if he was with her for a minute or two. But whatever the case is, he was with her. And he was with her passively. The calling of a spiritual head, a husband uh, in the marriage, is to reject passivity. But in fallen sinfulness, many men fall into uh, the sinfulness of Adam, which is to fall into passivity, to uh, 
to not uh, lead when we should. Another category that would be helpful is to uh, realize that spiritual headship means to accept responsibility. Accept responsibility. Again, Adam, he was a bad head. Uh, He did not accept responsibility. He was actually irresponsible. He was irresponsible in not even teaching his wife uh, the word uh, well, but he was irresponsible when uh, God asked him what happened. He blame shifted. Uh, In Genesis chapter 3, verse 12, he said this. It says, Uh, He said this, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. Rather than taking responsibility, rather than taking ownership, rather than saying, my bad, it's my fault, have mercy on me, he was irresponsible. He blame shifted. He blamed it all on his wife when he should have taken the blame. He should have taken the fall. So he was irresponsible. But what it means to be a spiritual head is for you to take responsibility, for you to take the blame, to even take the fall for your wife. Third, I think another good category that would help us is to understand that to be a spiritual head means to lead courageously, to lead courageously. Again, we look at Adam. And we see that he did not lead courageously. He was a coward. Uh, He should have protected and defended his wife. He should have crushed the serpent. He should have uh, stood uh, between them. However, again, he stood beside her, behind her. He was passive. He did not lead courageously. He was a coward. And then fourthly, uh, we see that um, ultimately to be a spiritual head means to invest eternally. How did Adam invest? He invested momentarily. He invested temporarily. What was good and pleasing for that moment, for that time, he invested in just for that moment. But then he lost uh, the eternal pleasure of the tree of life just for this temporary treasure. Again, many husbands, rather than investing eternally, they invest just for the moment, just for uh, this temporary period of time. But as husbands, you're called to invest to the eternal well-being of your wife. Now, this is, I guess, Adam's model of uh, a sinful extreme in terms of uh, poor headship, but we also see that there's the other extreme of poor headship, which is the complete opposite, not passive, but to be completely aggressive, to be domineering and dominant, to lead without love. And we see that uh, some husbands fall into this category as well. Uh, They are oftentimes cruel or violent. Uh, Again, rather than being passive, maybe they're actually too aggressive. Maybe rather than um, being irresponsible, uh, they just try to take over everything. Maybe they are very proud, very arrogant, rather than humble. And so many men and husbands fall into this extreme as well. When we fell into sin, All men usually fall into uh, one category or the other. But we see ultimately that that Jesus is the second Adam. Jesus is the perfect uh, model of a husband. He was the one who was the good spiritual head. That Jesus was the one who rejected passivity. Jesus took action. He became incarnate. He became Emmanuel. He lived among us. He was active uh, as his as a husband to his bride. He also accepted responsibility. He didn't say, oh, God, not me. He said, okay, I will take the fall. I will take the sin. I will take their guilt. I will take uh, their shame. He led courageously. He went 
all the way to the cross. And he invested eternally. He invested in our eternal lives, in our eternal souls. He went through short-term pain for our long-term gain. So husbands, future husbands, um, ask yourself, what kind of head do you think that uh, you may be like? Uh, we are called to lead like Christ. Uh, secondly, uh, we see that a husband is also called to sacrifice for his wife. A husband is called to sacrifice for his wife. Verse 25 says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Uh, earlier in uh, verse 2, uh, we saw this last week. It says, Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. I mentioned last week the, def the true definition of love it's not taking, it is giving. Lust is taking, love is giving. It is ultimately sacrificing yourself for another. And so the question for us husbands or future husbands is, do we die to ourself for the life of our wife? Do we give to her rather than take from her? Are we committed to seek uh, her highest good. And so some questions to consider whether uh, we would actually love our wife. How much are you willing to give of yourself to your wife? How much are you willing to inconvenience yourself for the sake of your wife? How much of your freedom are you willing to forsake? How much of your precious time are you willing to invest in your wife? Jesus gave it all. Jesus surrendered all. Also, thirdly, the husband is called to sanctify his wife. A husband is called to sanctify his wife. Verse 26, it says that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. What is that saying? It's saying that the priority in marriage is not happiness, but the priority in marriage is holiness. But coincidentally, happiness is the byproduct of holiness in marriage. If you pursue holiness for your wife, I guarantee you, you will have the byproduct of happiness uh, in your marriage. I'll tell you uh, when my wife is happiest. Uh, it's not when I buy her new clothes or a new phone. Uh, it's not when I do the dishes or throw out the trash. It's not when I buy her steak or sushi. As much as she may enjoy these things, she is actually most happy when I pray for her, which is not as often as I should. Uh, it's when I talk about spiritual matters, again, which is not uh, as often as I should. It is when I am genuinely interested in her heart and her emotions, again, which is not as enough as I should. As men, oftentimes, I think we think about giving in terms of these uh, external things, which are good. They are great. It's good to help around in the house. But are we giving to her spiritually? Are we seeking to sanctify our wives? Are we seeking to wash them with the water of the word? I'll be the first to admit that I'm more like Adam than I am like Jesus. Um, but victory in marriage is not giving up, it is getting up. That is the victory in marriage. Every time you fall, is to get up, to try again and again. Even after falling a thousand times, you get up again and you seek to pursue her. You seek to sanctify her. And so, and so some practical applications how a husband can sanctify his wife. Initiate devotions, whether it is sharing yours or asking about hers or doing it together. Again, we see that uh, we are called to 
wash uh, our wives in the water of the word. Also, worship. Worship together. Worship with your wife. Pray for uh, your wife. Pray for your wife's holiness. Spiritually protect her. Spiritually protect uh, your family. Husbands, men, being a man is not defined by having big biceps or having a big bank account or having a big head. Being a man is defined by having a big desire for your wife's holiness. That's what it means uh, to ultimately be the spiritual head for your wife. The manliest thing you can do for your wife is to sanctify her, to pray for her. You know, what is hindering you from doing these things? Whatever it is, you have to consider um, allowing yourself to be able to sanctify her. Again, reject the passive notion that these things will just happen, that her sanctification will just happen, because it won't. You are called to assist in this process. You know, prayer is not passive. Devoting yourself is not passive. It is active participation. So make it your aim to, to cover your wife in the water of the word. Again, this is not about legalism, but it's about leadership. And then lastly, a husband's calling is to satisfy his wife. It's to satisfy his wife. Verse 28 and 29 says, In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. Any normal husband wants to satisfy his own body, wants to satisfy his own flesh, wants to satisfy his own physical urges. And so the Bible is saying, in the same way, seek to satisfy your wife to the extent you yourself want to be satisfied. So how are you providing for um, the satisfaction of your wife? How are you nourishing her? How are you feeding her? How are you cherishing her? So how are you feeding her uh, physically? How are you protecting her physically? But I'm sure every husband will tell you uh, that more often than not, wives are satisfied uh, not so much physically, but mentally and emotionally. And so husbands need to learn how to uh, satisfy their wives mentally and emotionally by listening to their wives, by learning about their feelings, by talking uh, not to her, but uh, with her. And so, you know, there's that saying that, you know, men and women are different, that men are from Mars and women are from Venus. And uh, I think it is kind of true that men and women are different. But just because men and women are different does not mean that men and women are opposites. Uh, sometimes there's the, again, negative stereotype that only men are rational and only women are emotional. That's not true. Both men and women are both rational and emotional. Um, as a husband, uh, you need to know when to be uh, rational and emotional to live with your wife in a satisfying way. You need to know when it's right to be tough and when it's right to be tender. And so seeking to, to satisfy your wife to the extent that you yourself want to be satisfied as well. Um, I do want to close with some uh, words to the many of us who are single uh, in the room. And uh, again, this sermon is primarily uh, exhorting wives and husbands. And many of us are, again, not yet wives or husbands. 
and uh, hope maybe someday uh, we will be a wife or a husband. But until uh, that time, I would like you as a single person to uh, consider this. First, you as a single person try to become the right spouse. You as a single person try to become the right spouse. Don't worry about finding the right spouse, but worry first about being the right spouse. Rather than having a list of what you want in a spouse, try to flip it the other way around. Uh, Would someone want you on their list? Uh, Would someone want you as their spouse? Um, If you were to think about the opposite gender, would you marry you? Uh, Would you submit to you? Uh, would would you uh, want to, again, be associated in that way? I think that would make you think twice about, you know, just writing this list of unrealistic expectations about the person who you're trying to find. Ask yourself, how can you, uh, even now as a single person, work towards being the right spouse now? If you're female, that means that you are called to be like Jesus. If you're male, that means you're called to be like Jesus. And so even as a single person, uh, how can I be in the process of becoming the right spouse even now? And another thing uh, that I would like to mention is to know that even as a single person, you are married to Christ. And I know that sounds very cheesy. It sounds uh, just very elementary. Oh, I'm married to Christ. But that is the eternal truth. Unfortunately, not everyone who wants to be married uh, will get married here on earth. But every Christian will be married to Christ. That is the truth. Every Christian will be married to Christ. If you are a Christian, that means that you are engaged to Christ. It means that he is your spiritual head. He is the one who has perfectly sacrificed for you. He is the one that will perfectly sanctify you. He is the one that will perfectly satisfy you. And you know what? When you go to heaven, there will only be one wedding. That is between Christ and the church. There will be only one married couple in heaven. That is, again, Christ and the church. Pastor John Piper, he wrote a book called this momentary marriage. And I think that title is so good because it accurately explains that even if you get married on earth, it's momentary, it's temporary. The only eternal marriage is the one between Christ and the church. You know, my wife and I, we kind of half joke that when we get to heaven, we're no longer going to be husband and wife. We're going to be brother and sister. And so uh, we kind of half-jokingly pray that God would allow us to be roommates as brother and sister or just housemates as uh, brothers and sisters. And, you know, uh, hopefully God allows that. But again, in heaven, we're no longer going to be husband and wife. We're going to be brother and sister. Every single one of us in heaven are going to be brother and sister. The only married couple is Christ and the church. So think about that. Meditate on that. Because I think a lot of us, we do think that maybe singleness is a curse. But Jesus was single. The Apostle Paul was single. Um, You can do so much as a single person. Um, There are so many times when uh, my wife and I, we uh, kind of imagine like the the time that you know, singles have that we don't have because of our um, calling as husband and wife and as parents. And so as a single person, you have so much that you can do for the glory of God. So uh, even practically now, uh, be in a part of the church community because you can't make all of these uh, good and wise decisions on your own. Let's mutually seek guidance and counsel from one another, even from 
some of our married couples. Uh, there may not be many of us, but we do exist. And so, um, you know, seek counsel. And uh, I, I believe there could be a reciprocal uh, wisdom that would be imparted. Again, uh, the ultimate purpose of uh, marriage is not just for your happiness, although that is part of it. It is ultimately for uh, the holiness of Christ to be portrayed to the world. Marriage is ultimately meant to show how much Jesus loves the church and how the, ch the church lovingly uh, submits to Jesus as the groom. So let's bow our heads in prayer at this time. And before I close us in prayer, I just want to give you uh, a minute to, to reflect upon and to also respond to God's word. As a wife or a future wife, um, considering what it actually means to uh, submit to our one husband, uh, how uh, maybe the connotations of the word submit that is thrown around and uh, misapplied in our world has maybe tainted our view of what God has uh, called upon us. Could we ask God to help us to grow in that willingness? Uh, as a husband or as a future husband, could you consider what it means to be a biblical spiritual head, not to be domineering, not to be aggressive, and also not to be passive, but to, to lead courageously, to reject passivity, to accept responsibility, to invest eternally, how you can sacrifice for your wife, how you can sanctify your wife and satisfy your wife. Let's take a minute, let's pray uh, for ourselves and also for one another. Let's pray.